Hello, in this lecture we will continue on chapter 24, Departmental Income Statement. Last lecture we left off here and we created the combined income statement for the two departments. We've got the, the two sales departments and the combined income statement. It looks like a normal income statement that we have in that we have cost, the sales minus the cost of goods sold gives us the gross profit minus operating expenses gives us the total operating expenses and net income down here. And we noted that we have the direct expenses the allocation of the indirect expenses and the allocation of the service department. Now this is a handy way to look at this by department because it allocates out all the costs per these departments. But when we're doing an evaluation, we may want to move this around a slightly different format, which would look like this. We're going to take the department revenue minus the direct expenses, which would get me, which would give us the departmental contribution margin. So when we think about it this way, we are now evaluating, we use this oftentimes to evaluate the effectiveness of a department. And in order to do that, we should not be putting in there these uh, allocated amounts because the department generally does not have control over those. Those are miscellaneous allocated based on our best estimate, but the individuals that are running the department do not have the ability to control those costs because they are not the, the managers of those departments. So it's useful to see it in this way so we can see the bottom line of all the allocations. But then when we are looking to uh, judge a responsibility center and a manager and evaluate their performance, then we generally want to take out those indirect costs. So it would look something like this then if we looked at it in this format. We're going to take the sales cost of goods sold, gives us the gross profit, and then we're going to take the direct cost. So now we're breaking it out between the direct costs these are the costs that the different departments have control over, and that will give us the uh, departmental contribution margin. So when we're evaluating performance, this is the departmental contribution margin that we generally evaluate on, and hopefully those are going to be positive. If those are positive, then we you usually think about it in terms of uh, those being high enough to cover the indirect expenses. These being the indirect expenses now, that are now uh, being combined into one lump so sum. So then we're going to take these amounts and get down to our same net income that we had in the past. So department contribution margin indicate expenses are emphasized. Departmental contribution margin are positive, so neither department is a candidate for elimination. So if we were thinking of, de of closing a department, first thing, if these were negative, that would be the first indicator that we'd have to start thinking. That wouldn't be something automatically that would say, oh, this is not making money, but that would be the first indicator for us to be looking deeper in terms of should we close down a particular department or not. Evaluate investment center performance. So now we're moving on to the investment center, which we're going to evaluate slightly differently. So an investment center managers are responsible for generating profit and for the investment of assets. They will be evaluated based on their ability to generate enough uh, operating income to justify the investment in assets used to generate the operating income. So now we're thinking about basically longer term investments. And when we think about us putting money in to something similar to individual investments, what we are thinking about then is what is the rate of return on that? So if we're going to put money in, what's the expected rate of return? What do we want to receive for that investment? Then are we achieving that? Are we receiving the investment that we are set out to achieve? So two performance measures are the investment center return on assets and the investment center residual income. And there's going to be obviously pros and cons to both of these. Investment center return on asset invested, so ROI. Investment center net income is going to be divided by the investment center average in invested assets. So we're going to take the income that's being generated divided by the assets being used in order to generate them. That's going to give us our rate of return, our ROI. So if the investment center net income was uh, 526.5 for LCD and the S phone was 417.6 and the investment center average investment was 2 million five for the LCD and only 1,850 for the S phone, then just looking at net income, it would look like the LCD is better, is doing, is performing better. But if we took a look at the rate of return and compared that revenue to the investment being 
uh, put in to generate that rate of return. Uh, LCD is only 21% and the S phone is at 23%. So under the ROI um, method, we would say that the S phone is better off in this ratio. So LCD division earned more dollars of income, but it was less efficient in using its assets to generate income compared to the S phone division. Now, the other way we can take a look at that is the residual income. It's a completely different form of measurement. Uh, the residual income equals the investment center net income minus the target investment center net income. So if we assume the target uh, net income is 8% of the division's assets, then we can do a similar calculation. We're going to take the investment center net income for LCD is 526.5, and the target investment center net income is that 8% by the times the 2 million 5 means that uh, it's the 200. So the investment center residual income is 326.5. And on the S phone, we have the 417.6, and the 8% times the 1,850 gives us the 148. And so we have the investment center residual income of 269.6. Now, what are the pros and cons about using these two methods? Uh, the ROI is nice in that it's a percentage. So when we change numbers and we look at uh, divisions that are having a, a much different scale of investments and returns on investments, the percentage, of course, can then even that out in some ways and let us measure things that are not similar in terms of dollar amounts. But there's a problem with the ROI a rate of return, the prior one that we looked at, and that is that, say, that the target ROI is uh, 23, or say the target ROI is 20, and we currently have an ROI in the S phone of 23, it could be possible for us to be looking at a potential investment later that is greater than what our target is, above 20, maybe 21, but have the division still not take it on because the division has incentives to have the highest rate of return as possible. So even though it would be beneficial for the company to take it on, if we're being judged, if the division's being judged and rated on their performance based on a higher ROI, then they're going to be less likely to take on an investment that's going to generate a rate of return less than 23%, even if it's something that the company uh, would want based on their desired rate of return. So that could be a problem. If we take a look at it in this way, uh, then we have less of that problem. So that this is one way of kind of dealing with that uh, so that we don't have uh, that, that particular issue. So uh, non-financial performance evaluation measures. So collects information on several key performance. So we're going to take a look at the balance scorecard. So we have the performance indicators of this balance scorecard. So obviously when we're taking a look at any kind of division, we want to judge it on different types of measurements. And of course, when we think about accounting, we think about the main measurement being revenue, being how much money we're generating. But if we look at different departments, then revenue isn't the only measurement that we can use. We're going to have to use some different measurements in order to, to measure how different managers are doing. And we need to break that up in some kind of formal way so that we can measure them. So we could have customer perspective. How do our customers see us? So we could think of ways to measure customer uh, per perspective could be surveys or something like that. If we can quantify the data, that's usually better. So if we can number the survey <laughs> rate from 1 to 10 and whatnot, then we can still kind of quantify it. But in some way, we want to get a picture of what the customers are seeing, the, the division or the department of the company. Internal process in which, in which activities must we excel. So when we're trying to decide where should we concentrate, should what do we really need to be good at is it customer service we really need to be good at or is it quality products that is the main thing what's the number one thing that is the driving force that we have to excel at and and be very competitive in and then uh, the financial perspective how do we look uh, to firms uh, owners and of course that's that's the one we traditionally think about what's our financial perspective so we probably are more familiar with that in through our accounting classes innovation learning how can we continually improve and create value? Uh, every company now is changing. Obviously, technology is changing. Communication is changing. Uh, even large to small companies, well-established well companies to up-and-coming companies need to continually be thinking about 
what's the new change going to affect? How is it going to affect us? How can we take advantage of a new change and implement new changes into the future?